Okay, this is Pat Ward again. Uh, I want to talk briefly at uh, Eric Lassie's behest on the topic of morphology today. Well, I've always been very interested in morphology myself from day one as a fellow at the University of Minnesota. And to this day, I have pursued it fiercely by acquiring the most beautiful examples of hematologic diseases from, uh, that I can find anywhere in this country and indeed across the world. So I have a fairly large collection. I'm currently uh, putting together a monograph on the plasma cellular disorders from that collection, which should be available free, hopefully for everybody, if it is uh, published in, in my in my future negotiations, hopefully it'll be free. Anyway, in any event, morphology is the beginning of every investigation. A smear, a blood smear, starts everything, or a marrow smear. That's where it all begins. From there, it may segue off to immuno cytochemistry, to flow cytology, to gene sequencing, but it all begins with morphology. And I'll mix these remarks briefly with what I taught my senior medical students. The blood smear became very important. The first and most important part of making a blood smear, the most absolutely important part is, is correct drying of freshly made blood smears. If it's not dried properly, then the smear is useless. That's the most important thing I taught my residents and my uh, students. Wherever you are, the smears have to be air dried very rapidly or with a, with a fan on the, uh, uh, on the desk. I also uh, taught all the residents, because at uh, Montsani Hospital we used to have the residents from the university rotate through our department in hematology as well. I taught all the residents about, as I had learned previously at the university myself, that the, every investigation of a blood disease begins with some indices and the most important index one can have is the MCV. After the MCV, other things pale in comparison, but they're useful on occasion. For instance, I was always partial to the RDW, which is the a measure of anisocytosis. It puts a number on anisocytosis to where it means something. Um, so the, I always told our students and our residents that you cannot practice medicine without an MCV. You cannot practice uh, hematology without an MCV. That's the bottom of the line. Because you could divide all anemias into three. Those where the cells were too small, those where the cells were too big, or the cells were normal in size. Now, if you had, if you had an MCV that was below 80, then you knew where to start. If you had an MCV over 100, you knew where to start. The big problem arose when the MCB was in the normal range between 80 and 100. Where do you go from that? That's where it became absolutely essential to look at the spear and see if there were any clues in uh, the cells as to what's going on. You could hazard a guess with low MCBs and high MCBs and know where to go from there. But when the MCB is normal, you just don't know what to do, at least in terms of anemias. As far as white cells are concerned, for residents and students, and indeed for uh, pathologists in practice, 
I always, as a practicing hematopathologist, I always delivered, most importantly, in consult, in written consultations on, on uh, patients, I always focused on absolute values because the percentage of lymphocytes or the percentage of neutrophils in a given specimen was put there by God for the specific purpose of counting what is the absolute number per cubic millimeter. And percentages fluctuate all over the place, but absolutes, which is what happens when you multiply them out, strikes a hard chord that gives useful data. So I used to teach all my students in residence, I insisted on working with absolutes only. Very important because the absolutes are much more useful than than look and just look at percentages because unless you actually multiply them out, it's a waste of time. They uh, also, uh, while looking at the white cells, uh, it became important to look at neutrophils for both hypersegmentation and hyposegmentation. Hypersegmentation for B12 and folate deficiency, hyposegmentation for myelodysplastic syndromes, things like of that sort. Look out for those things. For platelets, the, important, the most important and most common problem encountered is what is an atypical platelet? What's a giant platelet? In order to, to call something a giant platelet, you've got to see the two parts of a platelet, which is the granulomere and the hyalomere. You've got to see them. You've got to see the, a granulomere in the middle of a, even a big platelet, and then you call it a giant platelet. However, however, big platelets that have no granulomere, that's when you're getting into some problems. And you're beginning to start thinking about myeloproliferative disorders. If there is no granulomere, then you may be dealing with a myeloproliferative disorder. Further still, if there is zoning in that granule-free platelet, if there is zoning from outside inwards, Darker, lighter, darker, blue. If zoning is pronounced, then you may well be dealing with a myeloproliferative disorder, notably primary myelofibrosis. So that zoning became important. Giants, giant platelets, no, not so much, although they occur also in myelofibrosis, but giant platelets can occur in normal individuals. And finally, on to the bone marrow. Now, at the University of Minnesota, where, we, where I trained with uh, Drs. Brunning and Sundberg, in that university, it was a very rigorous uh, department. And we had to, at all times, in all cases, count 500 cells in the bone marrow. Now, that became a lifelong habit, and when I, up until when I stopped hunting cells about eight to ten years ago, up until that time, I would never even contemplate reading a marrow without doing a cell count. It was always 500, occasionally a thousand, if there was some doubt about things. And very rarely we would do a 200 cell count if there were very few cells on the slide that are severely hypogranular, uh, hypocellular uh, marrow. We'd do as low as 200, but that was rare. We would look at a couple of slides to get up to 500. 
uh, towards that 500 magic number, I would have to say that uh, I've been lecturing all over the country for the last 30, year, 30, 40 years for the ASCP, doing lots of workshops, countless, I have no idea how many I've done. But I always ask the audience of uh, people that took the, uh, the workshop that we were doing, or that I was doing, how many of you do a 500 cell count? And invariably, out of the 50 or 80 uh, candidates taking the uh, workshop, just a handful of five to 10 will put up their hands and say, I do a 500 cell count. And this is something that I would point out to you now at this time, that th that is uh, t to me an abomination. Primarily because you can't find minor increments of myeloblasts by eyeballing. It cannot be done. And uh, that was the excuse other people gave. Well, I can eyeball a 3 or 4% myeloblast count. Nonsense. I have stronger words.